ES Audio. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with pride. Hello, I'm Lawrence Delalio. Welcome to the Evening Standards Rugby Podcast, supported by Fuller's London Pride. I'm delighted to say that Sarah Elgin is back uh, with us this week. Sarah, how are you? Yeah, thanks. I'm feeling better. You wouldn't have wanted me on the podcast last week. I was basically talking like that. I was sounding worse than I normally sound. I'm You're sounding better better now. Yes, I am. All good, thank you. Also joining us from uh, the Evening Standard is rugby correspondent Nick Perwell. Hi, Nick. Hi, how are you doing? Everyone okay? Yeah, all good, thanks. And this week, we've got a former Springbok captain as our guest with 42 test caps for South Africa and a rugby world cup to his name is Bob Skinstad. Hi, Bobby. Hello, everybody. Hi, Sarah. It's um, good to be here. Thanks very much for having me. Now, before we start, everyone here, obviously on the podcast, wants to pay tribute to the great Doddy Weir. He passed away at the weekend. Um, He was a proper legend of the game and an absolute gentleman. Uh, Lawrence, you're someone who knew him very well for many years. He was just a man who was loved by everyone, wasn't he? Uh, He absolutely was. It's such sad news. Um, And, you know, it was news that we kind of were dreading and we all knew it was coming. But I don't think when it eventually came uh, sometime on Saturday, it made the feeling um, any easier. You know, there was just it still felt like a huge amount of shock. As you say, he was a a huge, uh, huge man, a giant in a a big man's you know world, really uh, an absolute legend of the game on and off the field. Um, And I think you've you've only got to see the outpouring uh, of emotion, not just from the rugby world, but from the wider community to understand what an extraordinary human being Doddy Doddy Weir was. Um, obviously suffering for what was it the best part of five years with uh, MND, or certainly that's when he when he came out publicly. Um, incredibly brave, humble, um, courageous, generous, um, funny, 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 funny. And I think it's just his warmth, really, that I will remember more than anything else. Um, always saw him laughing and smiling. Um, he always tried to make every interaction that he ever had with anyone a very positive one. Um, there's no doubt that he left everyone that he touched in a much better place than when they started. Um, our love and condolences obviously go out to all his family, his wife, Kathy and Hamish, Ben and Angus, the boys. Um, just very quickly, I, I played with him on the 97 Lions tour. I was very lucky enough to be part of that amazing trip to South Africa. Um, he set the tone on and off the field. Um, we had a a uh, very touching um, anniversary, 25-year anniversary last summer, which Doddy was able to attend with his family. Uh, and it was just a, a an incredible moment. Every single player and every single coach wanted to be next to him and be with him. So uh, we miss him very, very much. And as I said, love to all the family. Absolutely. He just had... Um... And he had a way, didn't he, to make you feel very, very special when he spoke to you. Um, and obviously our thoughts, all our love, um, are with Doddy's family at this deeply, deeply sad time. Um, now, as you know, before we get into the rugby, I'd like to find out what everybody's been doing this week. Uh, Bob, I see you've been catching up with a, a few of your former Springbok teammates, but not for the purpose of watching rugby, for the purpose of watching football. Yeah, um, Sarah, it was, it, was, it was really nice to see the... Um... The guys, uh, I, I think you you worked closely with Brian and 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 a few of them together, and you, you know what it's like, um, or everyone here knows what it's like to be in the spotlight in and around the three days leading up to a rugby test match in the middle of London. You know, everybody recognizes you know John Smith or Brian Abano or whatever it is, so you can't get five minutes to yourself. But we, I I I, I pulled a bit of a fast one. I said let's let's find ourselves a, a football venue so that we can we can duck in. And then what actually happened was that they had a a spare room, so it was supposed to be beers at a football venue, but there was a spare room that was for coffee. So no one wanted coffee at five pm on on Friday afternoon. So we went in there and we said, "Could can we order some beers over here, please?" So we were we were completely alone for about three hours, which was absolutely fantastic. And I'm I'm still um, blown away by how little us South Africans know about football. But uh, when I sold them the game, it, it it was a better sell than than the than the draw that um, came out and the the level of entertainment. But we, we we got to catch up and reminisce. Everybody was in town for, I think, some of them for the World Rugby Awards and and various bits of media and and things. But 
they all had that time three or four hours together. So it was actually it was actually great. Like 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 Lawrence says, that that's what we value the most. You know the the relationships and and the beauty about that. I think it's Brian because he's always got a bloody phone or a camera or something on him, and he's so good with. <laughs> He, he was the one that. who he was the one who, who threw a picture out. I, I don't think anyone else had even even taken a picture, but but it was it was good to be able to celebrate it with a with a picture. Yeah. yeah, he drives me insane because he actually does things like that as well without kind of you being aware of him doing it. The first you see, I know, it, and, and he's it's good. On, he's good at it. And it's always it's, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, it's mm. great. Um, Lawrence, what have you been up to? Who have you been hanging out with this week? Um, well, as as uh, as Bobby said, you know when you when you get together with players that you played with or against uh, in the past, um, there's always a a wonderful you know feeling. Really, it's a bit of respect. You just pick pick up as if you you were still playing, really. And we all get invited to many events and dinners. Hopefully, you turn down most of them. But I attended something called the Sportsman's Ball this this week. Um, it's uh, it's full of packed. The, the room is packed full of uh, sports men and women from every single sport and they honour one individual every year. Tends to be someone that is not just a legend, but a but a sort of legend's legend. Um, last year it was Usain Bolt. This year it was um, Dan Carter. So uh, we were all there to uh, celebrate the career of Dan Carter. Uh, and, you know, what a career he's had really as a and very humble kind of guy. Um, so, uh, yeah, we listened to, uh, to him on stage um, and then we had a fantastic evening. And funny enough, but towards the end of the evening, most of the other legends of sport had all left, and it seemed to be the rugby players that were still left in the bar. <laughs> so we had it's a very good. About that. That's the norm, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, well, absolutely. It was a, it was a great night, and, and what a player as well. Yeah, what a player, and he doesn't age. Just really annoying. Yeah. He kind of looks the same now as he did, kind of in his in a prime rugby career, doesn't he? Doesn't age. I find that really frustrating when people don't no, do that. Anyway, uh, he, was, he was in top form, and and obviously talking about. You know all the international rugby that's going on across uh, across the weekend as well. Yeah, absolutely. Nick, what does a top sports journalist do when they have a day off, or do they have a day off? I don't know. The standard does. Uh, they sort of, standards sort of. Well, yeah, a little bit of time yesterday. Uh, I was actually uh, we just moved house, so I was in I was in the loft trying to fix a a gable wall. So uh, that was all. That doesn't sound very interesting, Nick. Oh, no, man, it wasn't great. On, we it can't wasn't great. We can't finish with that. Listen, Sarah, if, if Bobby and I have been to Tenerife, you've been to Eleven Arif, right? So come <laughs> on, tell us, tell, us what, tell us what you were doing uh, in your week off once you recovered from your sore throat. Well, see, I feel like I can retire happy now because this week I sang on stage, especially for you, with Jason Donovan. I was basically... <laughs> wow. A Welsh, three stone heavier, two foot taller, not as attractive Kylie, but I kind of still did it. And yeah, so it was amazing. I was have, so you shown, have you shown your, uh, your your kids the uh, the footage from, from that? I have, but they're totally unimpressed. Totally unimpressed. They do not understand the magnitude. Come on, they must have said, Mom, you still got the moves. They must have said, Mom, you've still got the moves. You've still got the TikTok <laughs> you know moves. Like, he called me babes in only a way the Scots could call Charlene babes. So yeah. I kind of that moment for me was kind of, ah, oh, do you know this is it? But no, it was a really good night. Um, Austin was there. He came up on stage. Austin Healy came up on stage with me as well to sing um, another Jason song and loads of money was raised for charity. So it was really good. Oh, well, done. well done, you. Well yeah, done. Good. Shall we put some questions to our guests now then? Oh, I would love to. Um, Bobby, actually, the last time I saw you, I think we were we were playing golf together. And I, That's right. I, I mean, your golf's a lot better than mine, but I did. Uh, I did recall that I said that we've got a lot in common. We both played number eight. We both played rugby for many years. We both were lucky enough to win a World Cup. Um, how come you look like you do, and I've ended up looking like I do? <laughs> did, you, did you get nowhere near the breakdown, or did you just so good that you didn't have to go? Lawrence, there? that's yeah. that's very easy to answer. I always played with someone like you who would go and fetch the ball, and then I would try and do something with it in the back line. <laughs> Listen, mate, it's it's honestly, it's a great pleasure to have you here. I know you. You live here in the UK, um, and we're going to analyse Saturday's game. Um, not not like the whole world has, but just moaning about England. But we're actually going to look at South Africa in a, in a little while. But um, just wanted to chat to you about your own senior rugby career. Um, you won the World Cup of, of Springboks won the World Cup in '95, and you would have been what about 19 or 20 or something. Um, what was the what was the sort of launch pad for you? You know, to get into the game because. Those early years were were transformational, really, for anyone living around the world, let alone in South Africa. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think 
you know, the, the, the one distinction for me, so I, I was a student at Stellenbosch University at that time. I mean, we, we um, I, myself and about three other guys who you, you would have heard of or played against, um, Brayton Pulsa and, and Louis Kuhn, you know, played in the early Springbok teams. And, and we all played SA Under-19 and then SA Under-21 together. Um, and um, we went on a on a tour that year, and I was captain of that team. It sounded twenty one, literally in the same year, so nineteen ninety five. And and then I got a phone call out the blue, and they said, "Look, everything is going to change after this World Cup. Um, you, we, we're now going to pay you to play rugby." And you know, I'd chosen to play rugby anyway, and I would. So it wasn't a long, difficult argument because then we said, "Okay, well, how does this all work?" And and literally, I mean, that's how rugby, you know, went became professional overnight as you know post 95 the the senior leaders of those teams negotiated with with broadcasters and various unions etc and rugby became a what you know, what you would call these days a vocation as opposed to an, an endeavor on the side of what you were doing you know and and especially in south africa it had been a fully amateur game all the way through um and in the in the brutal traditions of of amateur game you know you if you got injured playing rugby you you didn't really get helped out much. You know, you were hoping one of the other players was a doctor or something like that. But I went through with a whole bunch of, of, of guys and and that was the first the first year. So I, th- I think I probably put, you know, um, ink to paper, I would yeah. say close to first because they, they went and, and, and made sure that they'd signed up the younger players before they started negotiating with the senior players. So terrible move from our, our part because we <laughs> got paid any- nothing, whereas everyone, there, no, no money left. Um, I was going to say, did they have any money left? I remember you you made your debut in the game that I played in, actually, in 97, I think, um, where it was it was then a record defeat, 25-14, I think, by the Springboks beat us at Twickenham. Um, you obviously had a, had a real stint where you played for, for, for a number of years. What, what do you remember about your sort of early time within in the Springboks? Because they would have just been world champions um, and they were rebuilding that team, I guess. They were. I mean, I think um, so. A little bit like you, I started with some seven side. So I played alongside Andre Fenter and Rassi Erasmus in and around the seven side, and some of the outside backs and, and wingers did the same. And then I came in as a loose forward in a in a Western Province side, um, which was, I think we'd had about fifteen years of, of sort of trophyless rugby after being very dominant in the eighties, and and we won the Curry Cup in South Africa for the first time. So suddenly that propelled me onto the stage. I had a chance with the Springboks. Um, we toured at the end of that year. I think I only ever played sort of off the bench um, in in those in those games. And you're right, that was that was my debut at at, at Twickenham. Um, it was an amazing time. You know, we had we had sort of guys you would have played against Lawrence, um, the Gary Teichmans, Russi Erasmus, Andre Fenters of the world, Mark Andrews. You know, big, strong, um, physical guys who'd who'd, uh, who'd who'd really. St- sort of stamped their name on their jersey. And and the reason I mention it like that, I, I still look back to, you know, your guys' dominant England period and, and I can name the entire pack and I can I can probably name close to the entire back line. Same with ours in 98, 99. But now because there is rotation, there is revolution of players and you're in and you're out and you might play for one reason or you're a bomb squad member and then you're out and then you're back in. I mean, it's it's extraordinary how many more players that, and, and they seem to almost cast away more talent than than they keep as opposed to keeping guys together for the long time. So those memories for me are probably the strongest because you played the longest with a number of players. We had a guy called uh, Corne Kricher who was uh, an outstanding um, uh, sort of our, our open side flank, which, which, which is a six, not a, not a seven. Um, and Corne and I just had this perfect symmetry because, you know, he was, he was, incredibly quick to the ball, would be jackling, doing all that kind of thing. And then I could play second or third phase attack. And we had outside backs, big, strong outside backs who were very happy to carry up. So but by the time I got the ball, it would be in space. So it was an attacking option, actually. And and I think it was a slightly different way to lo- use loose forward. So we spent a lot of time together. And because of that, you remember it the most. So I think that's where it started. I had a bit of a break in the middle of my career. As, yeah, I, was as you know. ask you, I was going to ask you about that because, I mean, I remember when I played South Africa and I did a lot in my early career, I remember thinking, wow, I thought I was big. I thought these guys were big. I mean, I've never, never known guys so big in all my life. I thought I need to get myself a little bit bigger, otherwise I'm not going to survive. But, but you stepped away from professional rugby. Seemingly, you had it all. You played at every level. You, you know, you're getting paid. Um, 
What what was the reason behind that? Was it was it a did you fall out of love with the game or were you just a bit disillusioned or what? No, I think I mean it's a good question. You know what 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 was the the one reason? I think it was a combination of reasons. I think if you look at guys now in the in the sort of starting to treat the mental health kind of stuff, I think I was I was struggling for pure motivation of like just grind it out. We each I mean I loved rugby, I really did, but I. Oh, I, I've got to say this, and it's difficult because a lot of people always write me off when I do, but, but I, I found it quite, the monotony quite boring, like, you know, just, and, and we were still in that phase when, when, yeah. when you know, w- each year you would change your S&C guy and suddenly it was eight hours of gym versus six or, or four hours of gym and five hours of fitness or, or, or recovery was huge. Like, now everyone was experimenting except yeah. the bloody players. We were just subject to this experience. <laughs> I felt like a bloody lab rat. Yeah. You know, and, well, they, and, didn't know, and they didn't really know what they were doing. They, 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 well, yeah, we, we could have a longer conversation about that, but no, they didn't. And and they still admit now we were just testing, you know, limits of sort of human endurance, etc. So we would go like our, our, my coach at Western Province, Gert Smal, who coached Ireland and, and Gert and I just at that stage, I can say this openly, at that stage didn't get on. We do get on and, and we've actually, we never had an incident, but he was a big, strong, bullheaded individual, and I was a big, strong, bullheaded individual, so we were never going to just agree on everything. And he made me his captain and then was just forcing things through me. And I was like, hang on, sorry. The captain either agrees with the coach and we have a strategy, or you can choose another captain. And he was like, oh, well, you know. Then we had a fight for about two weeks. And by the end of that year, I'd had enough, and I said, okay. Um, And I came to the UK, um, I played for the Dragons for three months because I had a, a very ambitious agent who was probably trying to just grab as much money from um, uh, the, the Dragons owner, um, Tony, Tony, yeah. well, you were only there, th- you're ready there three months, Bobby. You're not going to remember I, his name. <laughs> I, I think I was there for two and a half. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, but, but I just found more of the same because uh, Mike Ruddock was there and he was amazing. I loved Mike. But then Mike got the Wales job. And he, and he buggered off. And then there was a new coach, Declan Kidney, arrived. And then he buggered off because he got the island job. I was like, hang on, guys. You know, each week and then each time a new coach would change, we'd have a new fitness regime. And then there'd be more contact on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday before a match. Anyway, so I I, I chucked the towel in and I went and I worked in the UK. I actually was a little bit, and I mentioned it earlier, I think I was at a stage in my life where I was like, okay, if I play rugby till 30 and I do get badly injured or something like that, you know, what the hell else do I do for a living? You know, and and I'd been quite entrepreneurial all the way through. I'd I'd worked at at a small ad agency and sports agency which I'd worked at, and then I went and pitched an idea to Saatchi and Saatchi, and I worked with them for for three years. I loved it. Um, you know, worked in and around sport, worked with Adidas, worked with um, Unilever and a, and a lot of their um, uh, sorry PNG and a, and a lot of their products, and then we were pitching on some Unilever stuff. So, across the States and Amsterdam and Europe, I, I just felt free again. It was lovely. And I was playing um, amateur rugby for Richmond. Richmond had had been banned um, and gone down about 10 leagues um, all before I'd arrived. Um, and then when I started with Richmond, I think we were in like London 2 South or something. And and three years later, we were on our way. We were one below uh, where they are now. So we we won a few leagues and, and I really enjoyed it. I got to play with my brother. And then my wife got pregnant and um, we were sort of thinking, you know, are we here for the long term? How, you know, what are we going to do? And I got a phone call out the blue from from um, uh, the Springbok coach, Jake White. And he said, we need a really old, slow, loose forward to uh, compliment our, our back row here. Um, and I watched you play for the Barbarians the other day. Are you still playing? What's happening? And I said, well, you won't see a lot of footage because I haven't been playing, but what do you need me to do? And And they had a, um, a discussion internally. He said, "If if you can make a Super Rugby um, franchise, team, yeah, yeah, yeah. A franchise, um, then we'll include you in at least the, the the players we're looking at." And I thought, "Well, I'll, I'll have a go." But the lure of the Springboks was 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 too much for you to turn down, even 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 though your wife was pregnant. The, you know, the, you're working hard. You just you just couldn't turn. You could, it's very hard to turn down your national team, isn't it? it? It is, you know, and I thought, look, selfishly, I must admit, I, I had already had discussions with Sachi and I thought to myself, if I was going to go back to South Africa, which we were quite keen to do, we'd, we'd been here three or four years. We, we're not f- sort of of a fixed abode. I mean, my mum's Irish, my dad was Scandinavian origin. So, so we, you know, quite worldly, but I thought 
especially with with having our first um, little one, you know, grannies and grandpas around and that kind of thing, it was going to be a lot easier in South Africa. So uh, that was one lure. And then and then also I, I had a lot of faith in that team. You know, they the, the Bulls had had won some Super Rugby um, matches uh, uh, finals by then. Uh, Faroui Dupre, Victor Matfield, they had a you know pretty strong Springbok side. They just won a Tri Nations. And I thought, well, if I can force my way in the side door, then uh, and then they can do all the work, and uh, and I can carry on, I can carry on buggering on in the backs. <laughs> well, we can't have you on without asking you about Rassi Erasmus. You've mentioned him already um, yeah. today. Uh, he's not afraid to ruffle a few feathers, is he? This we know. But I'm just wondering, you know, from a proud South African, his kind of recent comments. Do you think they're distracting the focus away from actually the Springboks achievements and, you know, on-field achievements and what they're trying to do and, you know, the, the, the success that they've had? Because it feels like, you know, it feels like it's starting to get like that now from, from the outside looking in. Um, so, look, I, I think it's a good question. So, so Rassi and I competed for the same position. So, at you know, for 10 years, zero love lost. And I can I can say that, that honestly, um, he, he's a bloody good guy and he's a he's a very intelligent, very hardworking, good rugby man. So we liked each other, but we wanted to whack the hell out of each other every time we played against each other. We we played and lost finals against each other. We we literally competed for, for the same jersey for probably six years, seven years. Um and I like him. I I, I really like him and I and I and I don't begrudge him that and I don't think he begrudges me that. I do think that that um, you know, there have been some comments about ex players coming out and saying, you know he's doing this and he's and he's taking away from the victory. I don't think he's taking away from the victory at all. He he does have his own sideshow and and he will attract blame for that. And you can look at that as something that takes away from his victory, but it's going to take a lot more than that to to deleverage a, a trophy out of a cabinet than than other coach sent a few videos around. You know, like I mean Eddie Jones, who I've also worked with has a platform and his platform has been traditional media and he plays it like the violin and he's done and he's done it seriously well that's and almost part of international rugby now isn't it you know Gats he, he you know like, it is well, it is well, yeah, I mean, these guys these, these guys are I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean yeah. I, I just I just wonder Bobby with um I mean look, I, I I think we all agree on Razzie's achievements as a player and then as a coach he came in two years before the World Cup he won the World Cup South Africa I mean the guy's a hero back home mm. no doubt about that and with a lot of justification but you know there's a process for for uh, criticizing referees I used to try and do it within the 80 minutes rather than outside <laughs> of but, but I mean it, it, I just wonder um, you know South Africa are clearly going to be World Cup contenders next year no doubt about that but Upsetting the world's best referee and attacking him publicly and personally, um, and bringing a lot of you know a lot of heat on his family on social media. I wonder how wise that is a year out from the World Cup because referees do tend to um, you know remember these things and um, you know uh, and they do tend to stick together. And I just don't think it has a place in the game. You know? No, no. I look, look Lola, I, th I think you're right. Or, you know, and and I'm not I'm not hiding from that. But let, let me let me just unequivocally say any any verbal physical written abuse or anything that's that, that, that that's gone on to, to to referees whether it's Barnsley or or his family or whatever is disgusting and and should not be I don't think you can attribute the blame for all of that directly at Rassi trying to protect his team I think those are two different issues I think the one and I'm with you I don't think that that's a platform that you should be using to criticize referees so so we agree on that how the platform, I mean, that's like saying, you know, Elon Elon Musk is affecting people on Twitter who are doing, you know, that that, that is a very no, different... No, 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 listen, uh, he just doesn't seem, to, he doesn't seem to post those videos when South Africa win. That's the only thing. <laughs> no, it, I, and, and I think you're right. And and I think he's posting them because he's trying to help South Africa to win, which is his primary job. Yeah. You know, if you look at, if you look at the video that he posted after the first Lions um, loss, they then won the next two games. I'm not saying they won it because of the video. But if it's an internal process and that's what you want. To, so, so what I will say is I will defend Rassi saying that, look, my number one is the South African rugby team. And if I think that's what I need to do to protect the South African rugby team, I'll do it. Mm. What I won't protect is whether that's the right mm. personal decision yeah, at the time. It, I, it, do do yeah. you know what I mean? I, I can't. It's like a guy, Lawrence, if you and I are playing against each other, you are. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm running for the line or whatever it is. I step inside. You stick out your arm to try and tackle me. Are you trying to take my head off? No. The, you know, you, you you pull me to the ground and it's a red card or it's a yellow card or whatever it is. 
the decision in that fraction of a second is one that you are trying to protect your line. Now, I'm trying to say that that Rassi, and and like I said, I'm I'm I haven't spoken to Rassi for three years, so so please don't you know that we're not we're not having conversations about this. Is doing something that he thinks is good, whether it is good or not, is a debate for someone else far, far brighter than me and, and and far better than me to say. I would imagine that everyone supporting the other team to the Springboks think it's not good, and everyone supporting the Springboks think it is good. So that's where we're caught in a in, and and will be caught in an endless debate. Yeah. It's that line, isn't it? I suppose not in the spirit of the game, and you can kind of like it, that line can be in, interpreted. Well, in it can be, it can ways. be, but then, but then, but then that's a, that's you know, the, you, then you're opening up Pandora's box because yeah, no, not in the spirit of the game. You you look at a guy like Rusty, and everyone says, oh, well, that's not the right thing. You look at his his internal coaching staff. How many people have moved on? How many people have moved away because of him being a horrible, vicious person? Zero. It's an interesting you know, discussion. How, isn't how, it? how many of how many of them would say we will go to him to the with him to the grave? It, the players are unequivocal. They are unequivocal. He is doing what he thinks is best to help us win rugby games, and 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 I can I can respect that. It doesn't matter who he is. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, as you mentioned, you're in the UK now, and obviously <laughs> you've been here for a while and enjoying it. When you're not kind of working on the rugby, Bobby, do you, do you in, still enjoy watching it? I mean, do you watch the Premiership? Do you? Do you catch up on what's happening in Super Rugby? I, I, I've started enjoying it a lot more. I think I, I, I probably took a, a little bit of a break, um, and and I was maybe getting a little bit of a bit fed up with Super Rugby. Um, you know, it went from sort of Super Ten, Super Twelve to not so Super Thirty Eight or whatever it was, and and I, I wasn't. Uh, I just wasn't enjoying the, the be- endless, meaningless games. Um, I'm really enjoying. I, I, I love the Prem. I've always watched the Prem and. And I love, you know, how competitive it is. I love the level of rugby. I was catching up with Scott Britz this this weekend, and he was just saying, you know, the as a um, as a sort of a microscope for who's coming. You know, that's where your baptism of fire happens. You you, you come through the Premiership as a, as a quality player, and you know you've got what it takes to at least compete to make the English side in particular. And and I think that's been long standing in the Premier. And I think it's a you know they they sort of forged with fire, if you want. Um, I, I must admit, I have enjoyed the, the South African teams playing some rugby over here. So I'm really looking to, to, uh, forward to the, the, the European competitions. Yeah. I think those will be good. It'd be a bit different and a bit sort of weird for everybody to see at first. But if they can play the level of rugby that they've been playing in the URC, um, the South African teams should be competitive and, and it'll be a bit different. Um, nothing better than a, and a quick three-day trip to Cape Town to go and watch your favourite team play, take on the Stormers <laughs> or, or something like that. So We're not getting I, I, any I, of that, though, are we, lol? We've not, no. I've, I've not had one of those in my <laughs> fixtures coming up, which I'm a little bit angry about. Not yet, not yet. Not I'll, yet. I'll, lol will send the private jets and... and oh, uh, lol will go. Invite. Don't you worry about that. You'll get there. I definitely won't. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so maybe we're going to have some more questions for you a little later on um, when you face... Lawrence and his tackled section. Uh, but listen, should we chat through the weekend's rugby? Um, I don't know, maybe Lawrence, you won't be so keen to chat through well, the, the weekend's rugby. I mean, I, but... I, I was there and uh, obviously I'm massively disappointed. Um, I'm, it's not my, um, it's not my, I don't particularly enjoy having to <laughs> be negative every Monday or, you know, or, or all the time about the England team. That's not what I want. You know, it's, uh, I mean, whilst I'm, you know, working in, in the media as such, it's not something I, I want to do. But, what I noticed is right across the you know the board, it, 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 everyone's analysing England, but actually sometimes you you have to focus on the opposition first and just say, Do you know, South Africa arrived at Twickenham. They haven't had a um, they haven't had a great um, autumn campaign themselves. Actually, you know they they've lost to Ireland, they've lost to France. You know, two sides that are playing very well at the moment, um, so they're under a bit of pressure. They had five or six players of their top players missing. Um, because of um, you know the the, the, the test window and, and having to go back to their clubs, they've had their coach um, not present at the stadium um, because of what he's done on social media. So let, let's not make any excuses. You know, South Africa didn't arrive in great shape, and yet they produced a performance which was you know resilient, gritty, tough. You know all the things you expect from South Africa. And in the final analysis, um, had they been a bit sharper, maybe had they had a few of those things I mentioned, they probably would have won by a lot more. So. <clears throat> Um, whilst I'm quick to uh, analyse England as, as the whole world is, um, you've got to say well done to South Africa. Very few people did that on Saturday, uh, saying well done to South Africa, mainly because they were distracted by the coaches' comments on social media. So they didn't yeah. want to thank 
we'll say but- congratulations. But England, yes, look, I'm disappointed. Um, the RFU have come out with another um, sort of statement saying, uh, you know, we're, we're analysing his results. Well, I can tell you now, 2022 has not been a good year for England. Um, they've they, they've lost more games than they've won. I think they lost six, won five, they've drawn one. Um, it's the worst set of results since 2008. And whilst I like to paint, as you know, the sun shines in my head every day. I mean, I like to paint the, the brightest of pictures. You, you can't move away from the fact that this is a results-driven business. And and a year out from the World Cup, you know, I am concerned, I am worried because the players and I, I, everyone is attacking Eddie Jones. And obviously, when you lose games of rugby, he is going to come under pressure because uh, he's the head coach, as Wayne Pivak is for Wales, as all these guys do. But as a group of players, there's a lot of senior players within that group now. They've all won trophies for Saracens, for various other clubs around the country, around Europe. And players have got to take responsibility, you know. I uh, are they what are they doing in terms of you know trying to drive the focus um because i'm concerned about the way england start games of test rugby against very superior high quality opposition tier one nations you know the game is technical it's tactical but if you don't have the right emotional levels if you don't right have the right uh, mental um preparation going into the start of a test match uh, you're going to lose now Bobby and I tell you that the majority of rugby matches are won by the team that's winning at half time. You know, that is a fact. You know, occasionally you get a glorious comeback if you're lucky, but they they are very rare. So that suggests to me that the first 10 minutes of a test match are really, really important, as are the next 10 minutes. And England, Mm -hmm. under Eddie Jones, I think uh, repeatedly, other than the World Cup semi final uh, against New Zealand and other than one performance away in Ireland, they're always second best in 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 that first you know opening salvo and against South Africa they're never going to take their foot off off your throat so I am concerned I am worried um, you know I don't think the RFU will will get rid of Eddie Jones um, and you know it's uh, it's disappointing because we are fifth um, in, in terms of our ranking but we're so far off the sides above us in my in my opinion um, that we've got a long long way to go. I'm going to argue the point of rugby matches being won by half time. Wales were up against Georgia and Australia, and we all know what happened there. Um, Nick, you uh, called England's performance naive, sloppy, and immature. So I'm kind of taking it you didn't enjoy it. Um, do you want to talk? Oh, us, I did enjoy talk it. I, did, I, that? I, thought, I thought South Africa were excellent, and I thought you know the fact that they had 14 men for 20 minutes and they weren't stressed tells you everything about where they were, and, and they'll go home very, very confident about their chances for 2023 because they'll come back with, you know, I think they've got 30 players that they can put in their 15 that they're very, very comfortable with. And I think that that's a hugely impressive situation for them to be in. You look at Kurt Lorenzo and his try, that was that was naive because the kick the kick was uh, too long, the chase was poor, and uh, um, and it wasn't even really a block, but um, England fell for that and it gave them far too much room. Immature was Johnny Hill, too cheap, uh, penalties in you know in, in his own five meters you know what one the penalty you know it's reversed for pulling Fafter Clerk out of the out of the the ruck by his uh, by his collar for no reason and only because they'd been uh, dominated up front and they were trying to uh, kind of uh, you know um, instill some kind of uh, fight back but they did it in the wrong way and uh, you know I think genuine hard men don't do things like that and they have to learn from that because it's not the first time with Johnny Hill he's an excellent player but he gets involved in these things that are not necessary can I, and, ask, a question, you know, can I ask a question why Why do we get I mean Eddie Jones every time England lose he comes out he said I blame me it's my fault yeah. why don't the play, one of the players come out and say um, just like to apologise to the nation for that performance because it wasn't good enough wasn't acceptable we take responsibility for yeah. it oh, would you have done that though Lol, when you played 100 percent you know you, you, you know you, you got you got really hard interviewers asking really tough questions post match and uh, you have to you just deliver the truth you know i think they yeah you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm sick to death of hearing from the coach if i'm honest with you i want to hear from senior players take some responsibility because that's what the nation needs they need honesty can, they want... can i ask something there lawrence and 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 i mean maybe you and nick know you are you closer to the squad or whatever it is but but i see you and your peers in in your teams were as senior players you were senior players i would i would assume you'd be debating some strategy you'd be talking tactics you'd be preparing together i don't see there is as many senior players in this thing i see it as eddie is in charge and everybody else does what 
what Eddie needs. Is that maybe a difference? Well, I think I think that maybe that you're absolutely right. But equally, when you've got players of the calibre class of of Owen Farrell, of Mario Toji, of Jamie George, these guys have won multiple trophies, multiple mm-hmm. multiple trophies. Actually, a lot uh, you know a lot more recently than Eddie Jones has. So. You know, I, I, you definitely be having that conversation. Mm. You know, there's there's a mutual respect, but you just say, look, I'm not. You're not the guy getting your face smashed in at three o'clock. So I mean, I'm. You know, this is the way we're going to play, and this is what we're going to do. And I just think that successful teams, and I've, I've, I'm banging on the door. I made it, it's about trusting each other and being consistent with what you're doing. And and I think um, those things are in short supply in the England camp. Um, you know. We've got a long, long way to go to catch up. Um, and it's disappointing because I genuinely believe there's a very talented team in there. But if mm-hmm. you are going to play in a certain way, then don't play Marcus Smith at 10 because you're not, you know, it's, it's not the way he wants to play. You know, if I'm a, if I'm a player, well, Sarah and I and you and, and Nick, we watch these guys week in, week out, and they're playing brilliantly in the premiership. And the question, the exam question they need to ask themselves is, how do I replicate that in an international jersey? Mm-hmm. And if it's... it's sorry, love. But it's, okay. well, Eddie Jones is, is is clearly not coming up with the right answers at the moment. Bob, you, quite- you, you you you've uh, been coached by Eddie, as as you said. In, in in he was a consultant, wasn't he, in two thousand and seven? What what do you what do you think of him as his? You know, I think I think Lawrence is absolutely right. I think he will he will stay on and he will he will coach the team to the to the World Cup. But what do you see about his his style? Do you think it's changed over the years? Look, I, I've got to be honest. So, so Eddie, Eddie worked with Jake, and and Jake was was definitely sort of in charge. But he also had a big bank of senior players. I mean, Victor Matfield ran the lineouts for about seven years at the Springboks, eight years at the Spring. Literally, you know, you turn up at the Springboks, and then he would sit down with you and have a meeting. Say, this is our structure. This is our calling structure. I don't know how you guys do it at your at your province, but this is how you can fit in. If there's anything you can bring to it, amazing. If not, shut up and get the ball that I tell you you're going to get. <laughs> And and you just say yes, sir. Three bags full, sir. So um, Eddie came in, I think, in more. Uh, let's question anything that that hasn't been questioned for a while. Let's 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 not put sort of tape over things. Let's actually, you know, if we need to restructure our counter attack, then let's do that. We had, I mean, that team was was freely scoring tries, you know, uh, using forwards and backs. It wasn't a, a sort of a one dimensional um, team. Um, and and Eddie was great. He he sort of unlocked a bit of creative thought, if you want. And 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 I think everybody appreciated him being around. And and it, uh, I think for him at that stage, it probably gave him a bit of a sniff again of wanting that international because it was pre Japan. Um, you know, he then knew the Springboks inside out, and then uh, you know eight years later led Japan to a, a famous victory um, over the Springboks. So he's 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 clearly intelligent and talented, but I, it's not. I, I don't have the context of, you know, because right now it's Eddie's team, like Lawrence mm-hmm. is saying. I, I'm not sure that it's the players and Eddie's team, which might be a bit different. Definitely then he was a contributor. Because that that's what I was going to ask, because I think it's probably it's a very similar situation to what we saw with Wales, I think, at the weekend as well. Because I, I want to know how much freedom do these players have at international level? Because we see it in the club game sometimes, don't we? If plan A is not working, someone like Marcus Smith would be like, do you know what, right, let's go on to plan B. So is that applicable at international level or is it different? Because like, I don't think Wales did it at the weekend and, and possibly... Same I just think it's it, you know players uh, uh, the game hasn't changed the game has changed a lot but in recent times the, the one thing that remains consistent is clarity you need to be absolutely clear about what is expected of you as a player uh, in your position in the team whatever team that might be on the field and the te- the teams that play well um, there's real clarity in what they're trying to do now you can argue that people might not agree with the tactics you know we watched South Africa for a long time kick the ball up in the air you know. We didn't like it particularly, but at least they had clarity in what they were doing and they tried to go out there and execute it. And um, when you turn over your staff every year, um, you can't possibly have clarity in your group because all the players that come into the to the squad keep changing um, by and large um, and the staff keep changing under Eddie Jones. So they've got a new defensive coach starting you know, just before the Six Nations. So these players, as, as professional and as well-drilled as they are, are having to take on different messages all the time. And I'm not so sure that's the easiest thing to do. Um, and? Yeah. In the, I mean, Clive Wilber changed the staff once in six years. Mm-hmm. One, Brian Ashton came and left and that was it. So the, the message was consistent and the trust was there to go out there and deliver that message. 
And I mean, so just to, to add, uh, th that's the answer I think you're looking for. Just to just to say, you know, each new defensive person, each new guy comes along with a, uh, you know, ten years history, files full of new ideas, whatever it is. Okay, guys, sit down, let's do this, and it takes away two hours of your mental time to just concentrate on your game for the weekend. And you know, you only get, I mean, these days because of the pressure from the clubs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you only get x number of hours together. You don't get, you know, and they've got to pick and choose and they've got to ask the recovery guys and the s &C guys and i mean it's, it's come down to literally minutes that you have with the individuals in a training environment so you can't relearn everything i'm not saying you, you must never change anything but you know you, you can over extend yourself when you're trying to innovate all the time i think i mean i i, I have a comment so, so, so south africa have got this reputation so we play percentage rugby etc etc we, we still the only team to to score tries in, in the World Cup final. And if you look at times when we've needed to surprise a team, look at what South Africa have been doing. We haven't run a ball outside of our half for five weeks, except three times this weekend. And suddenly, you know, you one of them goes length of the field to score a try. One of them, um, the, the inside pass didn't work. And one of them ends up in a penalty, uh, you know, which Fuff was trying to get the ball. But we, we got a penalty from it. Anyway, I'm going, if, if Rossi's not got some masterful plan, how come against England, not expecting that at all, are we counterattacking as the team who's supposed to kick absolutely everything? And, and I think that comes from player buy-in and from the staff knowing, okay, when we need to, we need to be able to, you know, it's, it's not rabbit out of a hat surprise stuff. It's rabbit firmly in the trunk under the bed, but we'll pull it up when, when we, need, we to. need to. It's not, yeah. not going to be pretty to get there, but we, we might need it against this England side because they're going to expect to just dominate us up front. You know, they've changed their pack. They've put on supposed bomb squad onto the bench to come on. Okay, well, it's disrupted our way. So I, I, I think that's easier to do if you've spent this kind of amount of time appreciating each other, playing for each other, playing with each other. The one thing, Rossi Erasmus came into this tour with absolutely no idea who his second best fly half is. Now he knows who his top four are. So Damien Willems, uh, one week into the tour, everyone's like, oh, he's absolutely crap, can't make it again. He lost by four points against Ireland, where Johnny Sexton has been probably the best execution oriented fly half in world rugby. And he didn't have a bad game, but he missed two kicks off, you know, uh, um, off the kicking tee. Now he comes on against Ireland, I mean, against England and absolutely bosses it in terms of when to kick, when to run, when to pass, never misses a tackle, two drop, drops into the pocket and knocks over two drop goals against, against an amazing team at Twickenham. That's a, that, that is an evolution over five weeks mm -hmm. of a player. The beauty is Marnie Libba came on and did you know, a, a 60-pointer against, against Italy. So now he knows there's one and two and three. Yeah. And as well, what you've done, I guess, over the last few weeks is, you know, and especially at the weekend, is, is you have kind of brought different players in, you've led youngsters in, and but you've not forgot your DNA as well. well. they're not, they're not been... all youngsters. He no, I know. Okay. You know, 38 year old loose force. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, Sorry. Sarah, do you think if we talk about England South Africa for long enough, we might yes. have forgotten about Wales? Is that what you... That's, I can see, I can see what you're doing 10%. here. I had one more question as well on Eddie, but okay, we'll move on then. Because um, I can I can, I can kind of bring that into to my Wayne Pivot chat, I guess. Yes, all right, let's move on to uh, Wales then. Because earlier in the day, they were 34, 13 up against Australia on 57 minutes, but it all fell apart, didn't it? Um, with the Wallabies win... Um, Okay, so both coaches, Dave Rennie and Wayne Pivak, they were under a bit of pressure coming into this game. Um, Wayne Pivak, I think, is probably still under that pressure. But Dave Rennie, he would have learned a lot about, effectively, a, an Australia A-side at the weekend. That's a fair statement, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, look, Australia uh, had to win that game, as did Wales. So it was a must-win game for both coaches, both sets of players. Um, you know, you, you talk about having um, excuses or whatever. But, I mean, Australia clearly have got a lot of players missing. We know that. Dave Rennie knows that. Um, but equally, they would have expected to have got more out of this tour. Uh, I think the way that they... I mean, if you look at their results, <laughs> I mean, the Italy game, um, were, were, you know, was, was was a real problem for them. But they've, been, they've not lost games by an awful lot. They've been, they've been there or thereabouts. Very, very close. And... Uh, again at the weekend, you know they they managed to pull something out in the last few minutes to win the game. So, it, you know it's even, even though results wise, it looks like a terrible, terrible tour for Australia. Um, you know in terms of what they've they used to historically. Actually, for those of us who understand rugby, um, you know you start to analyse the performances. 
they're, they're not that bad. You know, they're, they're, they're very, very close. Um, so, you know, they'll take a lot away from that um, and know that when they get their best players back, and let's be honest, Australia haven't got the talent pool in terms of numbers of South Africa, of England, <clears> of <throat> some of these other teams. Um, when they do get those players back, I think that they'll be a force at the World Cup, or certainly a, a much better than they than they have been in, in recently. Yeah, and I think Jamie, I've heard two people now actually say that Australia are their dark horses for the World Cup. Jiffy, I think he says that though before every World Cup that Australia <laughs> horses. Um, but Jamie Robin as well. Um, okay, let's talk about Wales then. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Two yellow cards, and I know there's been a lot in the papers. The substitutions that that were made didn't help at that time either. Um, Rumours now that Gatland and his appointment is imminent. Whether that's true or not, who knows? But like. 10 months out of a World Cup, like, would you be changing your head coach? Um, if, 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 if it's me, I'll, I'll jump in here. Ten, 10 months out from a World Cup, I would be enhancing the coaching group. I don't think I would be turning it on its head. So, so I mean, I, an answer for both, actually. Um, I think I would actually appoint a Warren Gatland into if if there's enough space. I don't know what, how it works budget wise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I would say Warren Gatland's going to be there because because you know of his experience, etc. We know where we're going as a team. You know, you try and send as positive a message as you can get after an abysmal autumn for for Wales, but you don't get out the long knives right now because then someone comes in. Um, Again, he's got to make all these changes. Does he keep, you know, the, the, the Alan wins of the world and 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 tips, you know, as, as their senior leaders? Does he have to change that because he's going to need more than ten months, you know? So I would I would enhance the coaching group and 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 actually someone said to me last night, what you you do in England's case? I said I would appoint Scott Robertson as an assistant coach, and then with the fact that he'd spent the last ten months under Eddie and Eddie goes because Eddie's already retired you know, post the World Cup, but he goes win or lose with him on the journey beforehand to see what's working and what's not and contributing his best bits. And so, so no, I wouldn't fire the coach, but I would maybe try and enhance that coaching staff. It's a, it's a, it's a hard call, I know, but I, it's so tough now upon all those coaches and those players to try and start again with 10 months to go. Uh, Lawrence, I know you know Warren very well. He was on the podcast, wasn't he, a couple of weeks ago. And I asked him as well pre-match, and he, and he said, no, no, he wasn't coming back. But there the, are the really strong rumours this morning, um, like here, that he might. It, would that be the right be, thing for Wales? It would be a lot easier for an incoming coach who's got a relationship yes. with the outgoing coach yeah. to also say, OK, as, 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 in a part-time role, maybe. Yeah, it's interesting, Bobby's comments, because um, when Ian Foster was under so much pressure in New Zealand, um, they didn't sack him, um, which they could have easily done. They brought in... Um, uh, Schmidt, Joe Schmidt, you know, and maybe just changed a few roles around, got rid of a few people. Um, you know, similarly, mm -hmm. and they've and they've and they've turned things around, and they're now you know doing okay. So, um, you know, it's, it may well be something that the RFU will look at. They know that Eddie's going uh, after the World Cup, so you know, if nothing else, it's a watching brief. Um, and in fact, Warren Gatlin spent a lot of time with. Before he took over at WAS, he spent seven months just sitting on the touchlines watching what was going well, what wasn't going so well. And actually what he did do when he took over was able to make those decisions literally uh, in a heartbeat. And and, and, then... I, and and I don't think it happens a lot in world rugby. You don't get the chance to have a watching brief. You don't get the chance to spend time with a person to understand, is it a character thing? Do the team like, you know, because you can have, the, you can have a, a, a big role with the coach, give him your good ideas if you want, because you're not going to not benefit yourself because they've decided to go anyway, you know? I mean, I mean, just sticking up for coaches for a second, you know, the, the hardest job must be knowing when to stick and when to twist. When do you move players on and when do you, you know, keep them going? And if you, guys like Alan Wynn, Justin Tipperary, all these guys who have been incredible servants to the game in Wales, amazing, amazing players. Uh, if you get it wrong, you know, the, the public, you know, Get, you know, give you a hard well, that's time. That's the thing. Don't you just shift that that pressure onto the new coach, like because then then <laughs> then the new coach got to go. Okay, I'm getting rid of your iconic leaders, and I got to World Cup and fail. It's like a you know, it's a double loss. 
And I think as well, there's wider problems, isn't there, in the game in England and in Wales as well, I think. You know, Nick, would you agree? It's you 100%. Know, it's... I, I, I think that, you know, it's in Wales, obviously, the problem is, and it's been the way for for a while. And I think Gatlin's great genius was, was managing to, to sort of mitigate this, is that the, the pyramid doesn't always come to the point in the way it needs to, and that the players haven't always been prepared uh, for test rugby in the best way and you know Warren would often say that the first couple of weeks of camp is getting them fit enough um, to, to to cope and thrive at test level so you'd often see them start slowly but um, and he would always bring that back together I think there is something in this in this talk of him going back I'd be very surprised if if it's um, keeping Pivak and, and bringing in Warren alongside that just because of his prior relationship with the setup in Wales and everything you could end up with a quite an awkward situation um, on England's situation, it was their original plan that they would have Eddie Jones's successor with them for the World Cup. But given that they've said that they've gone away from uh, the idea of having um, a, a, definitely having an English Englishman to take over, they've had to kind of widen that out because if it is someone like Scott Robertson or Ronan O'Gara, who are people that are on that shortlist with Steve Borthwick, then um, the, their availability might be uh, somewhat different. Um I mean, in terms of, yeah, I get the idea of bringing someone in with England, but as we've already said, they'll be on their 18th assistant coach already with the with the change that's coming up and, you know, in, in Eddie's tenure for, for next year. And that scale of change has, has been so big. Um, and, th- you know, th- to, Warren, uh, to Lawrence's earlier point, the players have been um, sort of standing up and taking the responsibility. It's just been drowned out a bit by, by Eddie Jones saying every time they lose, that that's my fault and I'll take responsibility for that. He's obviously trying to shield the players a bit, but um, I do completely understand the point that they, and I think the players feel this as well, that they need to take ownership of that and drive things forward. There have been some moves to that effect in the, in the last two camps, but I just wonder if with a softening of Eddie Jones almost takes away his strongest uh, point, which is, you know, making the players be, comfortable with it being uncomfortable if you like because he's always been spiky hasn't he when he's been at his best he's been really combative and all the rest of it and he, he's just seemed a bit calm really which is a bit unusual for him okay we could talk about this for hours couldn't we i know Lawrence <laughs> wants to go and wash his hair so we better move on to the premiership Whoa. um <laughs> okay um harlequins um added to gloucester's frustrations i guess on friday night a 21 uh 12 win wasn't it over just givington's men uh, for quins scoreless second half um and they stuttered a little bit to the finishing line didn't they quins but they showed that they can win the hard way lawrence good defensive effort and i guess yeah. it's a bit of breathing space doesn't it um, yeah i think look quins i mean it, when when you're a side like quins and you're playing at, at home at the stoop you know in in um and you want to keep yourself you expect to win those games don't you and and we can talk about it all day long. I think Gloucester have got a driving wall, um, which has always been their strength. But actually, you, you need to develop bigger parts to your game. They, they've lost a little bit of their um, their stardust in in Lewis Reece Zammer and uh, and Harris and, and and Adam Hastings. Number of players are missing in the back line, and I think unfortunately they didn't really have enough to damage and hurt Harlequins. And on the other hand, Quins. You've got a player of the class of Danny Care still left behind. Um, that's when you expect your your players who could probably still be playing international rugby. They're the ones that really step up. So uh, it wasn't a result I didn't expect. Um, you know, Quinn's uh, looking good. Yep, Saturday's games then. Newcastle managed to win over Exeter Chiefs, just their third of the season. And despite uh, being at the lead at halftime, Bristol Bears couldn't stop sale from another win at the AJ Bell. And Pat Lamb's men have only managed two wins, I think, now this season so far. Sunday, saw London Irish visit Leicester Tigers. 26-14 up for halftime. Um, the Tigers won. Then Irish came back in the second half and managed to level the score, but a try from Jasper Visa. And um, push the Tigers back into the lead. And then despite Tom Pearson's efforts at 59 minutes, the misconversion saw the exercise miss out on a draw. And it was just another frustrating game for London Irish, which sees them sitting at the bottom of the table. And interesting comments made um, on BT last night. And um, what was said, it was said that Leicester maybe aren't as good as their position, the position they find themselves in. And London Irish are not as bad as a position they find themselves in. Is that Was that a fair comment, Nick? I think in terms of Irish, yeah, I think they've been they've been really close close to it. But I think it, it, it that's that's often the massive frustration, isn't it? Teams can be really really close to everything clicking, but that missing ingredient sometimes is the is the thing that's the hardest um, to put put the finger on. Um, uh, speaking to Rob Simmons the other week, and he was talking about a lot of that coming down to 
um experience of being in those sort of situations and maybe them as a group kind of uh leveling out the experience with um the the older players and the younger players and certainly the the, the senior players have been desperate to try and take that on their own shoulders and take it forward and there's an awful lot of quality in that squad isn't there but sometimes that's you just need i think one of those tight games to go their way and then maybe they might get onto a bit of a roll Absolutely. Okay, um, time for us now to choose our standing uh, play of the weekend. Who wants to go first? Bobby, do you want to go first? Well, I've got to say I enjoyed seeing um, Anthony Watson back. Are you talking about the test matches or are you talking about in the uh, You can, you can choose anything. anyone you want. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, look, on, on, for me in the in the test match that, that meant something to, to, to us, I think Damien Willemse really stood up and I was p- pleased for him. But it was great to see Anthony Watson back in the context of this England outside back debate. You know, who's the person who can help there? It was just fantastic. It was a, it was a great. It's two weeks in a row now. He's been a, he's been good defensively and and back on attack. So I think that bodes well for him getting back into the England squad and 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 going to another World Cup. He's experienced. He's quick. He had a really difficult limiting time with an injury and just delighted for him to be back. Nick. Oh, a difficult one, isn't it? I think um, you probably say I'll probably say Arenza just for the try, just because I'm going to sum up um, everything that was right about the Springboks for the weekend and the things that England are still lacking in that um, X factor element. And Lal, who are you going for? <clears throat> well, I, I have to um, move away from international rugby because there was nothing that particularly inspired me at the weekend. Um, uh, so Danny Kerr, really, um, you know, England have been yo-yoing uh, between scrum halves for. Well, since the last World Cup, to be honest with you, um, you know, Ben Youngs gets every get, gets every other cap, and then the, the rest of them are shared between between everyone else. I think to have someone of, of Danny Kerr's quality still playing Prem rugby at the age he is, um, came back briefly, didn't he? In Australia, got got the Shepherd's Crook at half time or whatever it was, and then England went on to um, to win the Test match. And he hasn't. He probably won't come back into the reckoning uh, since. But uh, still, don't think England have solved their problems at scrum half. Um, but Danny Care, two tries for for Harlequins um, at his age, looking outstandingly good. Okay, I'm gonna go. Hmm, I'm gonna go for Jack Morgan um, on a lose inside because um, I, I thought he was brilliant again this week, and to think he wasn't <clears> taken to South Africa because he was too small um, and his ball carrying skills, not good enough. Um, yeah. I just think he's been class this autumn. And can I just have one more? Can I have two this week? Both from the Welsh game. Uh, Mark Nawa Kwanita Wase, the winger, the Australian winger. Like for me, he just epitomized that never say die approach the Aussies had. Anyway, I'm going for two. Okay. So let's take a look at what's coming up at the weekend. Then in round 12 of the premiership, um, Harlequins will be taking a trip down to the wreck to take on Bath. London Irish welcome Newcastle Falcons. Then you've got Gloucester who will see Northampton Saints visit King's home and Bristol Bears will be facing Leicester Tigers. But before we finish, we've got a few more questions to put to our guests. Uh, Bob, it's time to be tackled by Lawrence Delalio. Hey, Bobby, sorry to have kept you so long. Um, I, this, I'm no going to try and do something which um, which I didn't manage to do very often in my career. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I'll give it a go. Um, we, we ask these questions to all our guests. Um, so we're going we're gonna to ask them to you. Uh, your full name, please, Bob. Uh, Robert Brian Skinstead. Beautiful. Sounds very, sounds, sounds very... Uh, Regal. Regal. That's exactly what the word I was looking for. Um, do you have a favourite takeaway? You look like you keep yourself in pretty decent shape. So maybe once a week you go for what? Uh, lamb shawarma. Oh, good kebab. Um, did you have a celebrity crush when you were growing up? Uh, Charlie's Tehran. That's easy. That's a good one. <laughs> Top 10, definitely. Um, last <laughs> movie you watched? Top Gun. Maverick. Or to- um, the, the, the Top Gun Maverick. Yeah, yeah the new one. Um, and uh, what what did you have for breakfast? Uh, and and is it, I mean, I'm assuming it's changed from when you played. Certainly has um, oats and berries and some muesli um, and some nuts. Okay, very healthy. Um, <laughs> what is your nickname, or what was your nickname when you were playing? You probably had a few. Um, Skins, Skinners, Skinners was as has always been through. But there was a guy, there was a rugby writer who was actually a friend of mine. He tried to call me the pharmacist because there was a um, there was a, a pharmacy brand in South Africa called the Link, and he said I linked the forwards and and the backs. Oh. Never took off, lol. Clever. Never took off. <laughs> Very clever. Good stuff. And what was the best piece of advice you were given? Um, in a nutshell, I mean, it could be it could be away from rugby. 
could be. No, no, no. It's, it's easy. It's easy for me. Um, trust in whoever your God may be, but tie your camel tight. Like it. Like it. Um, who is the most famous person in your contact book, in your phone book? Uh, the person with the access to the most famous people is probably you, Lol. So, so I'm, 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 I can, I can, I'm, I, I'm just on head of one. security. That's all I am. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Yeah, I don't, I don't have direct contact with a lot of uh, super famous people. I could probably get hold of Elon Musk for us, but uh, that'd be for next year's uh, World Cup. You could get hold of him for Razzie if you could, please. Have <laughs> <laughs> um, Would he come on the podcast? <laughs> it's, 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 it's unlikely. I don't think he loved rugby at school, but um, he certainly is, is friends with a lot of rugby loving South Africans. Um, who would play you in a film about your life? Is that as easy? Oh, my goodness. Um, my life, a film about my life. Um, well, who who's would the you, guy? Who would, like, who would you like to play? Who would I like? Um, you could pick an who's actor. Who's the guy? From the office, uh, K- Krasinski. Yeah, is it John John Krasinski? K- Krasinski. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He he seems like a down to earth fellow. We'd we I'd get him to to be nice. <laughs> I thought you were going to go for some super hunk like uh, <laughs> Chris, whatever his name is, or bloody you know Matt Damon or someone like that. No, 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 no. no. Chris Hemp, no, Chris. Yeah. Um, who's uh, the funniest person you know, or who was the funniest person in the team when you were around, other than your good self? Um, in in the teams that we played, there are a lot of a lot of really funny guys um, always mucking about. Um, Jacques Ferry, the centre, was one of the funniest guys ever. But but in my rugby environment, it's hands down Andrew Mertens. <laughs> Actually, Justin Marshall said that the other day. And he is he is he is Hilarious, so quick. He? He's so quick. He's got he's always got a story. He's so de- self deprecating, but he was an amazing rugby player. And you know. And he talks to a room of 300 people. He, he literally calls himself fat and old and crap about 300 times, but he's telling a story about winning some tri-nations or whatever. You know? <laughs> i tell you what, he must be funny because I said, you know, his wife is amazing. I said, it can't, it can't have been your looks that got you that woman. It must be, it must be something else. Um, are, you a, uh, are you a dog or a cat family? Absolutely dog family. Yeah. What, what, do, you, what do you have? Just um, uh, uh, We've got a, a little miniature schnauzer called Millie. I can't wait to see you walk in that. I really, I want to catch you. <laughs> She's want to vicious. Catch you. Lol, don't stare at her. She's vicious. <laughs> I, I bet she is. Um, if you have to sing, if you have to get up on the bus and sing a karaoke song, what do, what do, what do they have? Bobby Skin starts singing. Uh, the Gambler by Kenny Rogers. Ah, you see. Sarah, you love that, don't you? Um, I love that. That's my favourite question of the whole podcast. Which, every week. Uh, uh, what's your, who's your ideal dinner party guest? Or do you, or you just, you, I mean, listen, you are everyone else's ideal dinner party guest. Who, no, who no, 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 no. I, I will tell you one thing. So, so that the only dinner that I can ever remember, it was like, wow, that's something never to be repeated. I, my wife and I had dinner with Nelson Mandela and his wife at his home. Literally, I was captain of the Springboks. I think, I don't know, he had an off night. He probably wanted to talk about why we were losing or something like that. <laughs> and he, and he sat at dinner with us. He had a half a glass of wine. He chatted about his life, his love for rugby, his love for sport, and just it was the most amazing, unrepeatable experience of all time. Well, you you were never going to top that. Yeah, we. No, I don't it. think we're so, and I don't want to. No. <laughs> um, who is, in your idea, is the best rugby player of all time, or who was the person that you thought was the best rugby player of all time? The 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 the, the player that made the biggest impact on world rugby, uh, which remains true to this day, it was Joan Alomo. I mean, I I grew up. I'm I'm almost the same age as him. May he rest in peace. Um, he was he played sevens against us, coming through just just in the year that he made his All Blacks debut. And and there was never ever a guy who was just that head and shoulders above everybody else on the field when he was on with them. Even even the second half of his career where he started to get sick and and stuff, he was just an incredible rugby player. They are guys coming through now, but the leap and you know, he was fifty percent better. Than the next person in his category, whereas now guys come in and they're ten percent better, or fifteen percent better, or eight percent better. He was on a different level. Well, I think no one. I mean, no one can dis. I mean, if you ask anyone in the world if they've heard of Jonah Lomu, they'll go, "Yeah." And so he put yeah. rugby on the map. And you've achieved everything in the game, Bob. Well, what's been your proudest moment? Would you say <clears throat> proudest rugby moment? Would you say was it winning the World Cup? Was it making your Springboks debut? Was it? I don't know. Just scoring. so I've got a, I've got a very sad, proud rugby moment. Um, I, I was part of a, a rugby World Cup squad, and I didn't play in a final. And I got dropped, uh, but I knew I was getting dropped because you, beggars, as the England squad, 
won a semi-final that you didn't think you were going to win and we didn't think you were going to win it. So we had two teams up and we know, we knew we were through. And once, once England came through, we play, we were going to play a, a different type of game plan. And, and I had to step out of my position in that, in that squad um, for a friend of mine, um, Vickers van Heerden, who's a, who's a fantastic, fantastic yeah. rugby player, but he used to go and, Put his head and neck and arms in places that, that I would uh, I would have feared to tread, lol. So so we knew that I wasn't going to play in that game. If we if we played against a different team, if we played France um, in that final, I, I would have played. And my proudest moment was that I was okay with that because that was part of the plan. What a nice answer. The only thing that that kept off that week is that I got the phone call. Well, I, I chatted to Jake. You know when you. It's a long hotel corridor passage. You can't avoid it. You're trying to melt into the wall. And, you know, you say, Bob, we need to chat. I'm like, oh, God, how do I get out of here? They couldn't find a laundry chute or something to disappear. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, 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 had the, we had the chat. And, I, I mean, I knew we'd already discussed it. Um, and then I got back to my room, disappointed, gutted. We had training. I was rooming with Butch James. And he said, um, he said, or well, answered the phone. It was my my father-in-law, and uh, Debs had gone into hospital early, so my son had been born the same day. So oh, swings man. and swings and roundabouts. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, there's always uh, always a bit of good news. Fantastic. Exactly. Well, exactly. Listen, Bob, it's been an absolute joy to have you on. I really appreciate it. We really appreciate it, and <clears throat> thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you soon. No problem at all. It's great to see you all, guys. Thank you very much. Look, and looking yeah. forward to next year's World Cup very much. Thanks yeah, so much. Thank you, Thank you so Thanks. much. So that's um, that's all for this episode of the Evening Standard Rugby Podcast, supported by Fuller's London Pride. And don't forget, you can watch the full video episode at londonpridebeer.co.uk. If you've enjoyed listening, uh, then please give us a like uh, and make sure you've subscribed to the podcast so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Yes, we'll be back next week. But until then, thanks for listening. Goodbye.